Okay, welcome everybody back to the Four Star Podcast. Uh, today is the 11th of March, and we're doing a full market commentary podcast today. Uh, I'm Brian Castle. Uh, I'm the, your your, uh, your host, my co-host, Chris Reardon. Chris Reardon, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for having me, and uh, excited to talk a little bit about the markets. Excellent. And uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Four Star Wealth, I'm an Eagle Scout trustee of the National Boy Scout Foundation. I'm the chief dad to Evan and Quinn and husband to the amazing Trippy. And uh, with me here is Mr. Chris Reardon. Uh, Chris uh, is the four-star director of development, master of all things portfolio trading reports, still loves his Clevelandians, caretaker of his new golden doodle puppy Hudson, who's actually no longer a puppy. And then we have a new Reardon uh, just last year. So congratulations, Chris. Thank you. All right. So, and of course, folks, if you like what you're hearing, Please, on Apple iTunes, give us a five out of five. Uh, that's that way, uh, more and more people hear what we're saying, and and uh, the, the better the better we get ranked, the better we do. So, thanks everybody out there. We're going to start in today with our discussion of the markets, the economy, and that we what we've seen generally out there. Chris, um, what is the positioning for all the different groups? I know commodities have made a big run here, and uh, stocks are waning a little bit. What does it look like? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's really kind of um, I would say the winner winner and loser. Uh, only one winner uh, I would say since the last podcast. So, and that was commodities. Like you said, they hold the number one position now. Uh, they're at 326 points, and they've gained 27 points since the last podcast. So, um, commodities has not slowed down. Uh, it's only really accelerated since the last podcast. Uh, and the number two position is domestic equities. It's at 273 points and it's lost two points uh, since the last podcast. So it's held that number two position and held positioning relatively well. Um, it had deteriorated a little bit, but nothing significant, um, not double digit downward moves. It's been you know moving down slowly, if you will. Uh, and the number three position is international equities. Uh, it's at 176 and it's lost 13 points. Uh, I would say that's the biggest mover downwards is international equities, um, and that continues to deteriorate. Fixed income is in the number fourth position. It's at 137 points. Uh, it lost three points from the last podcast. Uh, cash is in the number fifth position at 109 points. Uh, and surprisingly, it lost six points uh, from the last podcast. Typically in environments where we have high volatility, um, you know, negative markets, if you will, or, or downward movement in markets, we see cash start to rise. So a little surprising that that did go down. That's a good sign overall for the markets. Uh, and then in the last place in sixth, we have currencies at 70 points uh, and it lost one point from the last podcast. So uh, really the only winner um, since the last podcast has been commodities, everything else deteriorated. I'd say the biggest loser being international equities. Yes. Now, Chris, so, so that's really an interesting uh, report because the commodity area now is uh, carrying the tally scores that normally the U.S. stock market has carried for most of the last decade, a little bit more than just a decade. Uh, so that's kind of the high ranking usually when the number one position has in the 300s of tally scores versus all the others. So commodities are firmly in charge, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, it's it's been a pretty broad commodity run. I mean, oil kind of gets a lot, I think, of the, the showcase, if you will, just because it impacts us um, as consumers pretty directly. Everyone can kind of see that oil is going up at the gas station. Uh, but, you know, nickel has been on a historic rise. You have wheat, you have you have a lot of factors feeding into it. And, and on top of that, we're starting to see gold move up now as well. So it's it's been a pretty broad commodity run. Uh, not every commodity for sure has, but um, it, it, the breadth is much wider than oil, which the markets and the news cycle likes to kind of uh, focus on. Yeah, well, and it's interesting because most of our listeners and most investors for that matter have never really done much with commodities. And in fact, up until kind of the mid 2000s, it was really hard to trade commodities. Maybe you could buy companies that traded in the commodity world or they had some uh, had some effect on their earnings, but it was only in the 2003 to 2005 period when they started rolling out exchange traded funds that are based on a certain commodity or the futures on a commodity. So now you can pretty much buy an ETF of anything out there, uh, you know, gold, tin, aluminum, any, I mean, any commodity out there has 
an ETF that's essentially like a pure play on the commodity. And most of those are running now, Chris, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, um, there's I'm pretty much almost everyone. They roll them out. Um, I think new ones every year. They, it's only getting wider and wider the amount they cover. But um, yeah, it's, it's a great, you know, time or it's a great way to uh, kind of play on it. The other way is obviously going to the options markets and futures and, and it gets a little trickier there. So having the accessibility via the ETF and ETN markets um, is really good for just the general investor. Yes. Well, and, and so so that's what's running here. And so if you buy in those ETFs, that's what's been working. I uh, want to caution folks as well, though, um, if you do buy an ETF that rep represents the actual cash commodity like gold, the gold trust, there is collectibles tax on that. So taxes are a little bit higher on that versus normal capital gains in a security. But, um, but that's what's working right now. And, uh, you know, because of that, you know, the stock market obviously has been uh, seeing money come out of the stock market and a lot of it's going to the commodity market. S&P coming into today is down about 11% and the tax tech heavy NASDAQ is down about 15%. But the large names in the tech market are down even more than that significantly in our Last uh, our last meeting, we talked about the 20% plunge club, and there are literally dozens and dozens of companies that have crashed more than 20% in the technology area. Uh, so that's what's creating a big part of this decline. And tech is full all over the S&P. It's all over, obviously, the NASDAQ is more uh, technology related. And because of that, um, the four-star uh, protection plan has kicked in. So we start getting indicators turning negative into a negative trend. So as the indicators turn, then we start raising cash. We have four cash positions that will get us completely to a maximum cash level. And each portfolio has a different cash level. And we've actually had Chris gone to, gone to the third cash position now where uh, we're not quite 100 you know, maximum cash, but we're very close uh, because it's been a very rough market. So we're in the third position now with more and more indicators turning negative. So it's not not been a fun year so far this year. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, the markets have been extremely volatile, uh, both to the upside and downside. And it's been, uh, it's been a tough year for the markets. And I think it's been a tough year for investors so far. Uh, it definitely yeah. is very uncharacteristic of the last you know five year runs we've had. We've had volatility in certain spurts, but usually that volatility has lasted I think at the most three months in Q4 of 2018 uh, before kind of moving back down. That could happen here, but most likely with the current geopolitical situation and everything, um, volatility is going to be here to stay for, for the next little bit. It seems that way. And, and you know, we did seem to have a normal correction. Um, we spoke in previous podcasts how the technology names, the large cap technology names, went, went almost parabolic in the last half of, of 2021 where most stocks didn't perform that well. So you had to be heavily weighted in those large cap tech names, NVIDIA and, and uh, Tesla and names like that. And now all those names obviously have been correcting hard, but we had a normal correction that turned into a bear market uh, because of the, uh, the war, basically. The war turned it into a, a bear market. So now we have the typical stuff that goes on in a, in a bear market uh, where the technology names are in a bear where we have big, big down days and then huge up days. Uh, usually the largest up days in the market ever are in the middle of bear markets where the market goes down three or four days in a row and then there's a big relief rally and everyone jumps in. We had a day when the Dow was up almost 700 points this week and, and there's a big relief rally, uh, but then it goes down again. And of course we're up a little bit today, but we were down yesterday. So it's just a negative period of time the market uh, characterized by lower highs and lower lows. Uh, a, bear, a bull market, a rising market is higher highs and higher lows. So we, we still see the market making new, new lows and every time we rally, we seem to make new lows. So we'll see when that trend ends. When that trend ends, then the market is probably bottoming and then it's an opportunity to get back in. Our indicators will turn positive again and all that money that's sitting in cash will come back and get back into risk assets to the extent that we're comfortable with it. Yep, so. yeah, I mean, I think once um, we're definitely kind of, at least in the, the term right now, like you said, almost in a, a downward trend, 
Um, we don't know how long that's going to happen. Um, I don't know if anyone can necessarily predict that because there's a lot of factors impacting it, include, including geopolitical events um, that if things were to change today could, could change the tra trajectory of it. So, uh, yeah. but as it stands now, it's downward and we'll just keep, you know, I think our models and everything, we'll keep track of it. And once we start to see a bottom and move upwards, we'll start to get back in. Yes, exactly. And, and then there's still some, some supply chain issues that are holdovers from the pandemic that are causing issues. So today, for example, Rivian Auto is down on supply chain issues. Plenty of batteries out there, but they don't have semiconductor circuit boards and wire harnesses that were coming in from Mexico. So that stock's down 11% today. And uh, there's um, you know a lot of other issues going on. Now with the war, of course, a lot of things have come to the fore. Chinese stocks are collapsing now as the SEC issued a commentary about Chinese stocks failing to meet U.S. accounting standards. So they've listed a, 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 um, a, a, a group of stocks that they're concerned about. So those stocks are all plunging uh, with the Hong Kong index. It was the largest ever decline, I believe, the other day. DD Global, which is like the, uh, the uh, Uber of, of uh, China, that's down 12% 12, 12 on fears of delisting. So there's lots of issues in the market right now. But, you know, Chris, we'll come out of this at some point. So we're trying to figure out what will do well in this market. So we made a little list, Chris. Why don't we, why don't we go through that? Sounds good. Uh, so the banks now, as interest rates are going to rise, the market's still pricing in a number of rate increases, but the Fed may not be able to accomplish all that because the economy is sloppy and the war is creating more issues for the economy but they will raise rates at some level. Rates will rise, so uh, you know lending will grow, um, and then margins will grow for the banks as well. So we think banks could be a good place to be an investor, um, you know, depending on how the stocks trade. And then uh, number, number two is technology. Now, we talked about that technology is still the growth engine of the economy, and technology has created so many efficiencies, but the stocks got overheated uh, last year. So Technology is correcting sharply right now and the stocks are going down. Uh, so anytime we have a rally, then we have another big down day in technology, but they will bottom at some point. So if folks are looking to look, get in, invest in technology, we might get an opportunity here relatively soon, but you know, it might be a while too. We're not, not really totally sure, but we'll see the bottom and we'll be able to take advantage of it, but there's still growth in technology, isn't there, Chris? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I would say technology uh, especially you got to be careful on, um, you know, which companies, uh, certainly certain companies, I think, have more uh, headwinds, if you will. Uh, a great example we've talked about on here, Facebook and some of the uh, social media uh, stocks, I think, could face some headwinds over the next year with um, uh, uh, government action against them and congressional movements. So, uh, be careful, but uh, to your point, Brian, I think with this big pullback here, there is some value and, and there is no doubt that these stocks are the future. Um, it's just a matter of when to pick them up, when are they going to run and how long are they going to be in this pullback for, um, which remains to be seen. Exactly. Uh, but technology will always be a driver of growth and we'll just wait for the right time to enter. Um, now, also shipping, there's been this big backlog of, uh, of shipping because of uh, not enough workers and a whole bunch of issues. But once that backlog starts to fill through, some of it is clearing there right now, uh, that will help sh the shipping companies that obviously will help a lot of companies as well, but shipping could be a very interesting area. And then uh, we've talked about this number of time, home building, there is a shortage of homes. And, and I would say uh, part of it is homes in desirable areas. There's shifting going on from the North to the South. Uh, from uh, economically depressed states with high taxes to more growth oriented states. And so the, the states where people are going and there's clearly a shortage of homes, but even in, in uh, you know, econo economically challenged Illinois, uh, Chris and I are both trying to buy homes. Uh, Chris, you had an experience the other day out there. It's really tough, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly, uh, if you will, a feeding frenzy, especially on certain houses. Um, you know, 15, 20 offers, houses only being on the market for three days. It's, it's a very tough market. It's a very tight market right now. And I think you have uh, supply and demand is, is certainly out of uh, balance right now. Uh, and it's going to take two or three years for it to get in balance. And 
Um, so while that's going on, you have a lot of buyers that, that are looking for houses and, and for houses that are, are desirable. Um, and even in the state of Illinois, like you said, Brian, that may uh, from trends be show to be less desirable. There are certainly houses and areas within here uh, that are more desirable. So within those pockets, you, you certainly see a feeding frenzy um, of buyers um, and you see a lot of houses being bid up in some cases hundred thousand dollars over asking i mean it can be pretty crazy in this market yeah there's uh, everybody's paying over asking there's multiple bidders it's been pretty pretty nutty hasn't it um yeah well and, and also uh you know there has been in the last 20 years or so a dramatic improvement in the quality of homes being built and the style and changes and everything so a lot of homes that are out there, older homes are undesirable. So there's been lots of teardowns as well. So it's not, not only just a lack of homes, but a lack of the kind of homes people want to buy. Uh, so anyway, home building should be a good area. Again, watch the, the timing on the stocks. Um, but costs have doubled. It's only a, you know, an input cost. Obviously, there's labor and other aspects of a home um, building a home. Uh, but it's a lot of the costs have doubled. So prices are going up as well. And that's helping fuel the inflation. And then, of course, we talked earlier about commodities. The shortages sh shifting the supply demand curve. Anybody who's taken basic economics knows when the supply curve goes backward, prices go up. And, uh, and that's what's going on. Plus, we have two nations that are warring, uh, Ukraine and uh, Russia, and they're breadbasket nations. And they, they produce a lot of grain. So uh, grains are going up. We talked about metals before, industrial metals for building. So uh, pretty much the whole commodity suite is, is working. Um, I would caution everybody as well, however, that if you're investing in commodity type investments and commodities are an input cost to business, and if that keeps going up for a long time, that's actually not good for business, not good for the economy, but there's periods of time when lots of gains are made by investing in commodities. So be careful. If we have like a three-year commodity rally, it probably would mean we don't have a great economy. Um, so hopefully, hopefully the prices of commodities and the galloping increases start to ease a little bit here. But for now, commodities are certainly strong. And then Chris, you pointed out defense contractors should do well here too as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think um, the U.S. We just came in. I think we raised our defense spending to seven percent, if I'm remembering correctly. And a lot of nations around the world, including Germany, which is been notorious for underspending on defense have raised uh, their defense spending significantly. So um, obviously with what's going on in Ukraine now, it's been a shock, I think, and a wake up call to a lot of uh, nations who thought that that could never and would never happen again. And I think a lot of nations over the next five to even 10 years are going to start the process of trying to rebuild, upgrade and retool um, their militaries in the preparation for the possibility of of you know war or if uh, Russia or or even China or any of these countries with uh, ter territorial um, uh, kind of wants uh, would be you know trying to make an attempt. Yeah, we or we haven't had war, Chris, in Europe in seventy years since the nineteen forties. So so this is a big change, and I think you're right. Defense will probably be an area where a lot of uh, countries are investing in in their defense as well. Mm -hmm. The er earnings should be down uh, this year from last year. Last year was the pandemic recovery year. We had close to 30% earnings growth. Um, it's really anyone's guess at how the numbers come in, uh, but you know it's gonna be single digit growth. We've heard 8%, 4%, but there's so many things changing and so many issues driving that earnings number that really and no one has a handle on. So it's gonna be really hard to predict what that would be, regardless of their attempts to predict. I think it's very hard to predict. Um, but Chris, you know, you you uh, had the economic numbers. You want to run through those? Yep. Yeah. So uh, the first one will cover private sector uh, average hourly earnings. Um, they rose seasonally adjusted 5.1 percent in February, um, year over year, and so that's a slight slowdown from January. And I guess where where there's slight caution to that is the next number, U.S. inflation in February climbed to 7.9 percent on an annual rate, and that's a four-decade high. Uh, and what that means is if hourly earnings are only rising 5.1%, but inflation is rising at 7.9%, net net those, those employees and, and workers are actually losing, um, losing money. So losing that's, ground. yeah, exactly. So, so their, their buying power is not as strong. And so um, that's something to really keep an eye on if it sticks around for a while, because if you can't go and purchase as much, 
um, we're going to start to see just like you said, Brian, in earnings and all that, sales are going to start to deteriorate. Um, within that inflation number, if you include food and energy, uh, which tend to be the more volatile uh, parts of the inflation number, it still rose 6.4% uh, in February, and that was up 6% uh, from 6% in January, so it rose 0.4% month over month. Um, so that is, I think, very important to note. I think when we talk about inflation and, and the news talks about inflation being so high, most people tie it back to that energy um, and maybe food, uh, but energy really gets kind of the bulk of the blame. Uh, but this number, which excludes it, would show that it's not just energy driving these high inflation numbers. There's a lot of underlying factors feeding into it. Well, then, Chris, now that we have this war going on, we've heard uh, politicians being what they, uh, how they are, always look for someone to blame so they don't get blamed. So the administration seems to be blaming uh, uh, President Putin, who started the war in Ukraine, uh, Russia versus Ukraine, for everything. But, you know, as, as we pointed out here numerous times, inflation was, was high and galloping higher long before uh, gas prices went up because of what's going on in Ukraine. So... Uh, but but uh, politicians try to tend to blame blame things. Now, gas prices are 75 cents a gallon higher on average since the beginning. I think it's 15 days ago since the war. So everyone's seeing that now. Uh, but that, again, inflation was there long before the war began. What else do you have, Chris? Yeah. Um, so and speaking of uh, gas prices, so gas prices actually hit a high, an average high of $4.25 um, a gallon. And this was on uh, Tuesday of this week. Uh, and really see, I, at least in the short term, no sign of slowing down. Um, I think, um, you know, hopefully we will see some of the drillers and uh, U.S. oil production will increase this year. Uh, it's probably not at the pace it needs to be. And I think some of that has been, um, you know, I think a lot of these drillers are hesitant to come online because the administration has showed and voiced in the past its opposition to fossil fuels and want and need to, to phase it out. Uh, so for a lot of these companies, their, you know, their objective is to make money and doesn't make sense to uh, go in and start drilling, you know, hundreds of new uh, oil projects. One in five years, they're going to be uh, either overtaxed or, or going to be kind of phased out by the government. Um, so there's a lot going on there. I do expect this to hopefully start to top out, but in the short term, it's definitely going to go higher. Uh, yeah. the, the supply is not going to ramp up as fast as demand is there. So uh, next, in, initial jobless claims fell by 18,000 uh, to a seasonally adjusted 215,000. Uh, that was the last week of February. Uh, so what this really means is the job market continues to remain strong. Um, so, you know, that's a good sign overall, um, and hopefully if we were to see that to deteriorate, uh, that could be the, the first sign that we are starting to kind of possibly head to a recession, but we haven't seen that sign yet, even though we have a lot of stressors in the markets, uh, in the economy, um, the jobs have held up, which is good. Yeah. Um, going outwards, China exports rose 16.3% year over year in February. Uh, that beat estimates of 15%, but still a very noticeable slowdown from their uh, almost 21% increase in December. So Chinese exports are starting to slow. Um, and I think that feeds to what you were talking about, Brian, shipping. The shipping costs are, are going back up now. The Baltic Exchange Dry Index, which is essentially the, the cost of shipping goods um, you know, across the ocean uh, is up 15.38% from the start of the year, um, which doesn't seem like a whole lot. Uh, but when you account for um, during January, kind of before the war, um, this Baltic Exchange Dry Index had collapsed. It was down as much as 41.5%. Uh, so for it to go all the way down to 41.5% and rally back up to now be up 15.38%, that's a massive movement. And I think shows the impact the war in Ukraine is having on overall shipping, the rates, the cost of shipping now, and um, you know, it, it, there's a little bit more risk uh, right. for there. All right. Well, and, and so job growth, as you say, continues, uh, and, and hopefully that the inflation eases. So the best scenario, Chris, would be, you know, if inflation does start to ease, um, you know, now the uh, federal government has cut off uh, purchasing um, uh, fuel from Russia, so that'll probably have a higher impact on prices again. Uh, they haven't increased supply at all. And 
there's calls to reopen the Keystone pipeline and drill on federal lands. Instead, we're you know going begging to uh, our enemies, uh, Venezuela, Iran, and other places for oil because we're not going to buy Russian oil. Uh, so they could ease the supply um, you know issue by allowing the American in, in um, energy markets to be strong. We were energy independent uh, a year and a half ago, and now we're not because of some of the changes to the policy of the new of the new administration. So they could easily go back to that if they wanted to ease the prices. We'll see what they do. Um, so Chris, and uh, what we see out there, uh, we see gold hitting new highs, right? Yeah, so gold, um, it hit new highs. It's kind of, it's almost like it took a jump and then has kind of uh, slowed a little bit as late as it's around that 2000 um, mark. And it was trading a little bit below it last I saw, but that's a significant jump from about the 1800s it was trading before. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of that, we're dealing with a market right now where there's a lot of unknowns. A lot of people, Russia has a lot of gold. Russia is essentially being cut off from the financial market. So, you know, when you have these isolations, almost a financial war going on, really, um, that the U.S. is conducting currently on uh, Russia, a lot of people like to kind of uh, have that physical uh, value that that gold definitely showcases. Yeah, definitely. And we, uh, you know, we had mentioned for years that Bitcoin was taking all the all the action where people used to buy gold, and now Bitcoin uh, is kind of stabilizing in, in the in the mid, you know, uh, thirty thousands or forty thousand after a big run last year, and now gold is breaking out to new highs. So get. So Bitcoin was the new gold, now gold's the new Bitcoin, or maybe gold's the new gold, you know, but it's running up anyway. And then we had a short squeeze on nickel and it actually affected a Chinese bank that had to be acquired, I believe by JP Morgan. Isn't that right, Chris? Yeah, it was, um, so the short squeeze happened kind of Monday into Tuesday this week, uh, you know, in the US um, with prices, you know, futures prices, of nickel jumping as much as 250%, which is um, for a commodity, especially massive. And yeah, it was a Chinese kind of holding company, uh, Tsingshan Holding Group, uh, who is actually the largest nickel producer in the world. Um, so uh, the, the owner or kind of bank took a short position, um, essentially selling these nickel contracts um, below what they had and um, got caught. Uh, market moved quickly and, and they got kind of caught standing out there. And so uh, it caused a lot of uh, volatility. Uh, the London Mercantile Exchange, uh, which were, was where these contracts were traded, uh, had to halt the trading of nickel for from Tuesday to, I think it just reopened nickel trading today. Uh, so it caused a lot of havoc in the nickel markets. Uh, I think uh, what the uh, Tsingshan Holding Group is, is currently sitting on about $8 billion in trading losses. Uh, and how they're gonna, you know, so since they are a nickel producer, they really have two ways of unwinding their position since they were short. They could buy contracts back, kind of match it and buy it back, or they could deliver on the nickel, but um, delivering it is, is harder than, than you would maybe think because what, what um, they produce is nickel pig iron uh, and nickel mat, which uh, the London Mercantile Exchange does not accept because it's not 99% pure nickel. Uh, they're kind of less, they have other um, uh, other factors in them. So uh, what I think what they're going to do to kind of unwind this is they are going to swap their nickel mat with uh, nickel plates, which would qualify for the London Mercantile Exchange, and, and those will then be delivered. So a huge mess, like you said, Brian, I mean, it caused havoc in the markets, jumping 250%, halting trading, and um, really kind of spun out of control. And I believe still as of today, it's definitely come off those highs. Um, I think it's trained about 43, which is still up significantly, um, but not as you know as high as obviously the peak. Well, and, and for those who are new to that whole subject, the short squeeze is when someone has sold uh, to close the position you have to buy. And so if the price goes up, it creates pressure on someone who has sold it uh, because they actually have borrowed money to hold that position. So then they end up having to buy and take a loss if they sold it lower. And so then more and more short sellers panic and they buy and then it runs the price up and that's how it happened. And so uh, we had a nickel position in one of our portfolios that uh, was up to almost 200% in a week, which was crazy. Uh, it was good, but crazy. Um, so then 
Also, Chris, we, we've seen the, thanks, Chris. We've seen some uh, uh, activity recently, just in the last couple couple days because of the war and because of uh, the convoy in Canada where lots of Canadians were buying Bitcoin, uh, where some of the folks that were involved in that rally in Ottawa were uh, having their bank accounts frozen and uh, some pretty severe measures happening to individuals in Canada that uh, would be against all the rules in America, obviously. Uh, but we saw, so we saw people buying Bitcoin to avoid uh, the Canadian dollar. And of course, uh, the Ukrainian buyers of Bitcoin have been all over it as well. Now, the Biden administration announced investigations on Bitcoin and they purportedly said it was about fairness and then they want to um, you know, make sure that everyone is trading fairly in the Bitcoin market. But then they came out and said, oh, we're considering issuing a, a government backed cryptocurrency. And if we all remember, um, not only a number of months ago, the Chinese government did that. And part of the reason, if you think about it, why people would buy a Bitcoin is, or gold is they want to get outside the regular money system, monetary system. So why would anyone buy uh, a government sponsored cryptocurrency? And basically China outlawed uh, investors buying Bitcoin. Uh, so now you have to buy their cryptocurrency. And I've speculated that we could do that here in the 1930s, the federal government did outlaw individuals owning gold and they asked for all the gold to be sold to the government. And so they, they had a process they went through. They could do that here too. I mean, it, it's entirely possible. Although when we said that we knew nothing of what was going on, but it looks like they're actually thinking of doing that. They're actually thinking of getting rid of Bitcoin and issuing their own Bitcoin. Um, that way uh, it, it, it causes less issues with the massive amount of debt that the federal government has issued. So when governments get into debt trouble, uh, they wanna control all the other things people might buy that would be called a currency. Uh, and that's what they're doing here. So, so we, we thought it might happen, I'm surprised it's happening so quickly. Uh, hopefully they don't outlaw Bitcoin, but anything is possible. Yeah, I, th I think that if they did try to go that route, Bitcoin is a lot, oh, I think there's challenges with gold as well, but Bitcoin is pretty tough to, to try to go and collect just by the, the, attract, the nature that is it, it's attractive, right? Is because it's hard to really trace. Um, and you could, certainly people could have, you know, millions of dollars in Bitcoin on a hard drive or a disk. Um, and it'd be really hard to kind of go and track them down and find them. I guess you could bar the apps or certain things like that, but I would be surprised. I mean, gold still plays a very important part in the markets today. I think Bitcoin will have a, um, you know, a spot to play in the markets moving forward, uh, maybe as more of a gold substitute, um, but, but who knows? I mean, I think anything's possible and on the table. Yes, and we just uh, received a report that the federal government is now banning seafood and vodka and other imports from Russia. Uh, and so uh, I, think, I think over a hundred major multinational companies have also backed out of Russia. Goldman Sachs is moving out, JP Morgan's pulling out of Russia. So all these companies are inflicting uh, economic pain on Russia. Uh, and of course, uh, earlier in the week, the Biden administration announced that they were getting rid of uh, purchases of oil and energy from Russia. So uh, now that's a wild card to the economy as well, <clears throat> because that'll increase some, some costs also. Uh, plus, you know, companies that did sell lots of goods in Russia won't have those sales. So that could affect certain earnings. So that's why I was saying before, it's gonna be hard to really predict necessarily what earnings will look like, because there's so many things like this that just keep happening. And it's hard really to quantify all those things all in one earnings number to come up with like an estimate. So we'll just see how, they have to see how things uh, shake out, Chris, right? Yep. Yeah, I mean, it'll be, and I think a lot of those companies are going to get hit on the, the news of the withdrawal for the anticipation of the lower earnings. Like McDonald's is a great example, right? They're pulling out of Russia. They probably have hundreds of stores in Russia. So you can imagine the impact that losing that revenue um, coming from that region. Uh, but, you know, I, I think that that'll be probably showcased earlier, that's going to lower what the expectations of the revenues are going to be. And, and I think overall, it could be a good, good spot to buy, because uh, overall, it will moderate back out once those kind of get backed out of the revenue numbers for McDonald's. And then, you know, kind of moving forward, uh, it'll be more renormalized, if you will. Yeah. Well, we'll see. There's lots of, uh, lots of confusion right now. 
Uh, it's a really interesting time, as the Chinese say, may you live in interesting times. Uh, so on the positive note, though, uh, we do put out blog posts on the Leadership Matrix blog, uh, which is my, my blog, and we talk a lot about different things that are happening. One of the things that's happening is there's still continuing to be innovation uh, in, in new entrepreneurs. And if anybody remembers the story that some of the top technology companies in America were founded right in the depths of the 1970s, severe recession because of the oil market. We put out a blog post about an innovative store called uh, Dom's Market. Uh, and it's uh, an, a new twist on food markets where there's delivery and restaurants inside. And in, in addition to shopping, and that's on, that's on, our, on our blog post right now at fourstarwealth.com on, on the uh, 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 Leadership Matrix blog. And then a bunch of other innovations. So you know, people uh, will continue to innovate and come up with new ideas. Uh, we're coming out of the pandemic. And so everyone's ready to get out. The sports games are opening up. Major League Baseball looks like they may have solved their strike, possibly. That's what we're hearing, getting more details now. So hopefully it'll be a much better summer in 22 than it has been in the previous two years where there's stop and go and stop and go. And, uh, you know, life wasn't the same in America, but hopefully normal life comes back as we get going forward. Anything else on your end, Chris? Yeah, I think one uh, one final note I'll say is, uh, I think this was pretty cool. Ernest uh, Shackleton, uh, who was a explorer from kind of the 1950s, um, his ship, the Endurance, which got crushed beneath the Arctic ice and kind of sunk uh, about 107 years ago now, uh, they finally located it. Um, it was 3,000 meters under the, the wet LC uh, in the Antarctic, and it was in pristine condition because there was no wood eating bacteria or none of the anything that would really deteriorate the ship. So um, it, really cool. Um, some of the pictures that have come out of it were really interesting. So uh, it's a great discovery and find, I think, for the world uh, to see this this magnificent ship and um, kind of finally being found. Nice. Well, and maybe now that all the travel restrictions are being lifted, uh, Europe has mostly lifted many of their travel restrictions. America has as well. So maybe again, we'll get back to normal life, go back on the road and see the world right so that'll be fun uh well good well i think that's it that's all we have today chris uh why don't we why don't we leave it there uh, thanks everybody for being with us again uh on the four star wealth today's market explained podcast we have a couple of really interesting interviews that will be released as well uh we inter did an interview with a real estate expert chris rising out in uh, california in los angeles right downtown los angeles what's going on out there uh, in the commercial real estate markets and a couple of other really interesting interviews. We're planning on having our four-star economists, uh, Bob and Josh Barone, to come onto a podcast and give us an update on where things are here shortly as well. So we look forward to all those. So uh, thanks, Chris. Thanks, everybody, for being with us today in the four-star podcast. And we'll be back with another episode very shortly. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>